Hey everybody, welcome back to the Wahoo Warrior channel. This is going to be Tactics Talk, edition number 3. And we're going to be talking about the anti-tank slot in your standard reinforced platoon. So if you're making a reinforced platoon, you see that you got the anti-tank uh, slot. And primarily that usually has one of these uh, things in it, depending on what nationality, which is an anti-tank rifle. It's pretty universal. Uh, Usually you see those in early war or in minor country type of lists. Uh, uh, and a tank rifle, I do like that quite a bit. I, I remember when I was a kid, I used to have, I think they're National Geographic cards and an index thing. Uh, the World at War, World War. And uh, I know the boys in a tank rifle was in there. I thought that was very interesting. Uh, big game <laughs> rifle. Uh, there's a, a German Panzerschreck team right next to it, which is basically the German version of a bazooka. Uh, I got a bazooka team and then I have a Piat team. So when you're looking in the anti-tank slot, uh, you know, when you're building a reinforced platoon, and that's one of the things, uh, you know, that obviously whatever you're going for in your platoon, you should have a couple anti-tank assets. Uh, this is one option for some armies. Uh, some people take them, some people don't. Uh, they're available in uh, usually... Uh, inexperienced regular and veteran with regular being 50 and uh, veteran I think being 65 I don't have my book in front of me but it's right in that same uh, ballpark the same as like a sniper and same as a medium machine gun team so you're looking at the same level of points investment for an order dice some people take them just for the extra order dice and just in case some people take them for their primary anti-tank uh, I, I have tried that uh, depending on what nationality you're playing and we're going to talk about some squad based anti-tank devices we won't get in depth into those in this video because that'll be a separate video as far as upgrading your squads but we will talk about those a little bit so real quick anti-tank rifle 36 inch range plus two penetration so if you're shooting at an armored target you're getting plus two at uh, ranges within half which is 18 and you're getting plus one against uh, armor penetration past that uh, it's obviously it's not going to knock out a, a panzer 4 tank uh, on a regular basis uh, you would have to be super uh, fortunate to get like to the rear at close uh, to be able to uh, really do any chance of knocking it out I suppose uh, because most of your medium tanks are 9 armor uh, at long range you can't even penetrate the front of a medium tank so you're looking at mostly trucks and half tracks uh, one note though on any of these devices on any anti-tank is considered a heavy weapon uh, if you're not familiar with the rules if you're if you're let's say you're shooting at and we'll get into a couple scenarios but let's say you're shooting at uh, uh, a eight armor tank at long range theoretically you cannot harm it because the most you can do is plus one against the front so that you rolling a d6 if you get a hit you can the most you can get a seven you can't hurt it if it's a veteran it will not take a pin no matter what the crew's seasoned enough to know that it, it they're not in any danger if it's a regular which is the most common vehicle you see out there a regular vehicle will take a pin 50 percent of the time on a, I don't remember what the book says, but basically like a four, five, or six, you take the pin, and a one, two, or three, you're safe, or it's flip-flop, but whatever. I always announce it before I roll it, so my opponent knows I'll say four, five, or six, I take the pin before I roll. But, uh, so, I mean, it's not the greatest, but it is a chance to put a pin on if you score a hit, uh, even if you can't penetrate. So, just got that out of it. And inexperience always take pins. So, if you're shooting at an inexperienced vehicle with a heavy weapon and you score a hit, even if you can't penetrate it, it still takes a pin. So, something to keep in mind when your opponent deploys his army. Uh, usually, you don't see too many inexperienced vehicles. Sometimes you do. Uh, and uh, especially if you're looking at like uh, support weapons like howitzers and uh, those uh, trucks with the uh, rocket launchers on them. So, real quick. <clears throat> Panzer Shrek team, 24 inch range. It's uh, plus six penetration. It is more expensive than a bazooka team. I think it costs 60 at regular. It jumps quite a bit up there to for veteran. But uh, you look starting to look at the cost of an armored car. Uh, but it does have a very powerful punch. It's basically a heavy anti-tank gun. It's porting around. It's a small team. All these are are small teams, so they're harder to be hit. 
and they're positioned properly, it can be quite a pain in the butt for an enemy to take out. But because you know, shooting a small team in cover uh, with a light anti-tank gun doesn't do. It's very difficult to do. Where if you're shooting at an armored car or a small vehicle with your light anti-tank gun, it might be a little easier. But uh, so one thing about these these are considered these other all these other three are considered shaped charges and in version one they weren't that great version two they used to have a minus one penalty to hit for shaped charge they got rid of that so they all got basically a plus 16 percent increase to hit because they went one up on the pip they're no longer hitting on a base four so they're hitting on base three like any other shooting and the other nice thing about shaped charges is that they don't lose penetration value past long range. So if you're shooting that Panzerfaust or Panzer Shrek team at something, a vehicle 24, 23 inches away, uh, you're going to take the minus one to hit for long range, just like any other shooting. But if you do score the hit, instead of it be going from plus six to plus five due to loss of velocity of armor piercing round, you don't lose that with a shaped charge. So that's kind of nice. Uh, the anti-tank rifle does because it's not a shaped charge. It does lose some one, but the other ones don't. So the bazooka team, very similar to the Panzerstruck team. In fact, I think the Germans copied the bazooka pattern, or maybe the other. I, yeah, I think that's right. So the bazooka is plus five penetration, uh, which makes it a little cheaper in the points. Uh, the bazooka has the same range, 24 inch. It's a shaped charge. So it's just a little cheaper with a plus five. I find plus five is a pretty, that's a medium and a tank gun. It's pretty decent. Uh, and then the Piat team, Piat team is cheaper than any. Uh, it's plus five like the bazooka. But uh, unfortunately, it's a spring-loaded weapon, which in real life might be okay because it doesn't give away your position, like a back blast from a bazooka. You also don't have any uh, danger of, killing the guys behind you or firing it out of a uh, say a, a building you wouldn't want to be inside a, a shooting a, a bazooka out of a out of a small building because you would probably uh, in, do some damage to yourself and your friends inside there but these were advantageous in that but in the game they only shoot 12 inches which kind of sucks uh, it's very limiting <laughs> you have to really get in tight uh, it can be a nice defensive weapon to trail behind your squads, though, and uh, to keep enemy tanks from driving to point blank. So we're going to talk about those guys in particular. There's also a few other anti-tank slot things, like the Soviets have a um, have a uh, launcher, a Molta cocktail launcher. Uh, it shoots kind of like a howitzer. It has a chance to catch things on fire. Uh, there's like, a, I think in the... In, uh, some of the sea line lists, there's uh, some other added on, uh, like a blackguard bomber and like a petard launcher or something like that. I don't, I'm not very familiar with those. But they're all kind of, they take that anti-tank slot. Uh, the, uh, they may, some of the, the launcher thing may be in the artillery piece. But anywho, you get the idea. You can usually choose one of those. It's a zero one selection per uh, reinforced platoon. Uh, however, there's a few armies that can take additionals uh, kind of like the Americans can take more machine guns the like no the Soviets can take up to three anti-tank rifles per uh, anti-tank slot so a couple other anti-tank things we're going to touch on real quick but uh, is uh, and it, the reason I'm touching on them is because when we're talking about uh, anti-tank capabilities when you're building a list you're either going to have you're going to have armory yourself or artillery pieces and when you're choosing between an anti-tank gun or a howitzer you want to you know you're gonna to have to balance what you want your army to be able to defend against and accomplish so if you're planning to take a howitzer in your artillery slot and uh, we're getting into mortars and whatnot and a mortar for your mortar thing you're gonna have some ability to shoot infantry now you need to kind of look at being able to fend off uh, armor from getting too close one of these may be an option for you, if depending on your theme and depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, the, a lot of people take anti-tank rifles because it's a cheap order dice. It's one of the cheaper ones for an effective thing. So uh, it's also, oh, let me talk about that real quick. So a lot of people call the artillery rifle also the poor man's sniper or the reverse sniper. 
So basically you're shooting at plus two penetration. That's against armor, it loses one plus one. It does not lose the, one of the penetration points against people. So you got a 36 inch range, same range as a sniper. Uh, if you shoot at say a veteran squad, you're rolling to hit as normal. If you do score, so it's harder to hit than a sniper, but if you do hit, you get plus two to try to kill something. You don't get to exceptional damage automatically and pick what you want. But a lot of people use them as a backup role for putting pins on squads from range, kind of in, in conjunction with their snipers and medium, medium machine gun teams. It can be very effective at that. One thing that a lot of people ask a lot of times I see on the boards is, can a bazooka shoot at infantry? Uh, can a panzer shrek shoot at infantry? And the answer is, yes, it can. It does not have any special rules, however. So if you have nothing else to shoot at and you decide to shoot at an infantry squad, you're going to roll to hit as normal. If you do score a hit, it doesn't have a template. It's not considered HE. It's actually a heat round, uh, high something anti-tank, high energy or high, I don't know what it stands for now. I used to know, heat, it's a heat round. But in the game, it doesn't give you a template against infantry. What it does, it just really, if you score a hit, you're gonna get plus five against a guy. So you're really gonna kill one guy really, really dead. Uh, does it, most time you're if you're not shooting at something you're in a nice position and you're in an ambush uh, protecting a terrain feature or keeping a vehicle at bay if you go pop shotting it at infantry you better make sure that you're not going to regret that i've had some pretty comical games i remember one against mark smith uh, he came over from iowa and we were playing and he was running <laughs> advancing i should say he would advance and he was firing basically over his shoulder as my uh, infantry was coming after him and uh, he scored uh, consecutive hits on multiple turns and then I think I failed a uh, order check with my squad and went down and he was able to escape. I wasn't able to pick up that order dice so that was pretty funny. But okay other than that we've also got three uh, very common and there's probably others. There's more exotic ones like a uh, like an engineer uh, storm pistol or something but the most common ones uh, that also are heavy weapons but these are squad based they can be sometimes purchased as a team uh, the, these two anyway uh, well this one flamethrower that's a flamethrower as well uh, flamethrower and a panzerfaust so those are squad based anti-tank uh, direct fire. There's also armies that can take knee mortars, but those are not direct fire. Technically, they're a heavy weapon, but you're going to be firing indirect under them. We'll cover that in the mortars uh, section when we talk about mortars. But these are direct fire heavy weapons. The flamethrower obviously uh, is usually made for killing infantry, you would think, but it's actually very effective against armor because uh, you can force a check with it. It does plus two, plus three penetration, uh, D6 hits. You roll all, all those D6 hits against the armor, against the top armor of the vehicle, and uh, even if you don't penetrate the armor, you the vehicle still has to, as long as you score a hit, it still has to take a uh, terror check or the crew bails. So it can be very effective against armor. Bad thing about a flamethrower, six inch range. Uh, six inch range is very, very short. Uh, so you're at long range past three, but you're at point blank the entire time. That can be confusing to some people. Pistols are the same rule. So you move a flamethrower, you minus one, it takes a movement penalty. They're not automatically hit like they used to be in version one. I think they're way fixed. They're still very powerful, but at least they're they're not auto hits like they used to be. I think they're very playable now and fair. I think every army pretty much has access to one if you want to take one, and there's counters to them. Basically stay away until you kill it or put pins on it. So the flamethrower and then the panzer a panzer faust now armies uh and you generally see this when i'm in my debates about early war versus late war but that, that's one of the biggest advantages i think that late war has over early war is that they have squad based anti-tank devices uh in particular like the panzer faust which the soviets use uh, the germans use the romanians use uh, most of your access have uh, powers have some access to them. I don't think the Japanese do. They have, oh yeah, they actually Japanese have stick bombers. I don't have any Japanese, but that's an anti-tank unit as well. We're gonna put these chindits to represent suicide anti-tank bombers. <laughs> now they, I'll get to them in a second. So uh, we were talking about Panzerfaust. Panzerfaust have a 12-inch range. 
So they're at long range past six. Uh, with inside six, they're at point blank and no, suffer no long range penalty. It's a shape charge, so it doesn't suffer the over long range minus two uh, damage. They're plus six off the top of my head, like the Pandra Shrek, uh, for penetration. They cost five points each, and depending on how many you can put in your squad, I recommend paying the five points to put them in your squad. It makes this squad uh, very uh, independent of uh, extra units to keep armor off their back because I'll set up a few demonstrations. You do not want a tank with two or three medium machine guns driving to within six inches of your infantry squad and just shooting, 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 or maybe something with a 75 millimeter gun and multiple machine guns being camped within point blank of you and you nothing you can do to it. So uh, that's something to consider. Uh, Anti-tank slot. Uh, Japanese have a few, I'm using these chinits to represent them. Basically, anti Japanese anti-tank, suicide anti-tank teams. It's a two-man unit. You can buy them inexperienced, regular, or veteran. I don't know how you would get a veteran suicide bomber uh, because they figure if you were successful the first time that you would no longer be alive. But I guess it just represents more fanatical people. But... uh uh, they have plus eight penetration. The, the trick is that they have to assault you. And they charge your vehicle and they blow up. That you, they, the Japanese will lose that order dice, and you'll most likely lose whatever vehicle they run into, barring them rolling a one or really poorly on the damage result chart. Uh, they're cheap. They can take up to three per anti-tank slot, so they can uh, take a bunch of those. Uh, the bad part is they you know it is a it is kind of a cheap order dice you're going to lose an order you're going to trade an order dice for an order dice so that's one of the bad things about it but they can be effective uh, they also have a few other uh, anti tank well no they're not in the anti tank slot they're just extra units that are made for tanks but all right so i'm going to set up a few demonstrations on my board here i set up the board 4 by 4 uh, not using the entire board, but I think this will give us a broad enough way. You can see I put a road, <coughs> which is going to affect many times in a game. You go to a, a, t a game and you see there's a road. You can pretty much, if you see an enemy's opponent, you see that they have wheeled or track vehicles or any kind of vehicle that you really need to keep that in account because you can move pretty quickly across the board on a road in a vehicle. And uh, anti-tank assets guarding roads becomes very, very much a thing. So, all right, I'll set up a few little scenarios, and then we will get into uh, some uh, practicality uses of these anti-tank devices. All right, so scenario one, we're going to talk about the anti-tank rifle. I went ahead and uh, kind of set up the board here. Uh, we've got basically, uh, just for demo purposes, you know, we've got a, a little Romanian mortar uh, squad there in the thing, in the little wreck, uh, lieutenant behind there another squad over there and we've got a panzer 38t it's a light tank has an eight armor uh has a light anti-tank gun coaxial medium machine gun and a whole mount medium machine gun so it's uh, i think it comes in at 135 points it's a standard kind of light tank uh and the british here have a medium machine gun on top of that building we've got a gurkha squad there across from the Veteran over there looks like they're going to try to contest that center objective and then uh, or the center building and then uh, we've got another squad here. So when you're deploying your units, uh, if the Romanians set up first and the British are deploying, we're going to want to where are we going to want this anti tank rifle? So uh, one, you want to try to be in a piece of cover. Uh, they Snipers deploy after all setup. So if you can put yourself in a position uh, where you can threaten armor in a couple turns and also keep from getting snipered, that'd be great. Um, you have to worry about uh, you have to worry about the snipers. Uh, you're gonna know what your enemy's army list is. You know when you when you come up to the table, you're supposed to go over each other's army list. So if you know he doesn't have a sniper, and that's not something you're going to have to worry about. If you know he does have a sniper, then you have to watch your deployment. If you have a sniper, you know, counter or drop a spotter first and uh, see where his stuff goes. Now, 
you and a tank rifle has to deploy in the deployment phase. That's one of the reasons why people, like some people, kind of like to bring their anti-tank assets in on from reserve, maybe in a small vehicle or part of a uh, one of the components inside a truck, maybe with a squad, whether it's a Panzer or a Panzer Shrek or a bazooka or something, uh, Piat team, especially in a vehicle, because they're so it's a short range. But in a tank rifle, so I'm going to go ahead and deploy it. So if we're going to deploy it, we got this dense train in the middle of the board. Uh, that's nice because people can't see us unless you're in it. And then, it, like in the middle of the board here, we'll have a be able to fire anywhere over here or anywhere over there. Paying a particular attention to the road because the vehicle, even if that Panzer 38 wasn't deployed on the board uh, and it stayed in reserve for a turn, you got a pretty good, even if it doesn't come down the road, you want to deter it from using the road freely because it can be super dangerous. If it comes in from reserve and rolls way up here, if you have got uh, units or maybe a vehicle or something over here, you don't want it using this piece of cover and then it's wheeling around and getting side shots on maybe your armor or a truck or armor car or even just getting close to your infantry really fast and starting to blast them with machine guns at short range or even point blank range or even worse. So we're going to try to deny that road. If that's all we have for anti-armor anti capabilities, maybe if we have an armored car or something, we may be able to double up on it. But for the sake of this scenario, that's all we have, the, the lowly anti-tank rifle. And that said, usually anti-tank rifles are a good support with additional anti-tank. I wouldn't rely on anti-tank rifles to be your main and only anti-armor capability. So we're going to deploy this guy right here in this house. And when I deployed this squad, I made sure to leave me a space uh, to be able to deploy this. So as long as 50% of the models are in cover, you're fine. Doesn't really matter where you put this other guy. One of the bad things about laying down prone models is they take up a little more room. So I've got our anti-tank team in that nice piece of hard cover. And it's not uh, fixed. Uh, the anti-tank rifle is not fixed, so you can move it on an advance and fire it with minus one. It's got a 360 degree arc of fire. So we're going to put it right there. We're going to wait to see if that Panzer 38 comes down the road. You know, as we get farther into these tactics videos, obviously all the units working together is what you want. You want a harmony of units supporting each other. Whether it's a medium machine gun assisting uh, an infantry squad or anti-tank gun assisting a squad by keeping armor off its back or knocking out a vehicle or working together, that's the key. But we're just going to go over the basic mechanics pretty much for now. So if the game starts and the Panzer 38, uh, well right off the bat, uh, we know there's 12 inches to here, 24 inches. So we're, we put ourselves in a position where we're not going to be able to probably fire towards the back edge of the thing. And that's fine. Stay protected. Uh, unless you unless you knew you didn't have a sniper and you uh, were pretty confident that you could knock something out right away. It's just probably better to be safe. So basically they've done the deployment. The, there's that uh, Gurkha squad kind of standing out in the open. Uh, they got nice cover from the building and stuff. They're trying to come up to here, but with this road, it makes them vulnerable. So this uh, player is going to go ahead and they pull the first order dice. You're going to do an advance on a road. You can go double, so it's 24 inches. He's going to go 22 inches to here. And his, his, now his front arc on the tank goes from cross to cross. So like that. So where this team is, he's going to probably need to turn, if he wants to get his whole mount on them, he's going to have to turn a little bit. So having your anti-tank rifle there, on one hand, makes him think about exposing that side armor uh, to try to get that shot with the whole gun, the, the front whole gun on them as well. Uh, a lot of people do that, they like to throw a lot of dice at a single unit, or you'll have to stay in the, to the front and just fire that whole mount towards somewhere else. So, either way, it's good for the British player because uh, you get a side shot or uh, or less shots on your squad that's kind of standing in the open. So, this guy, he'll just be uh, 
cautious. He's going to turn slide like that. He's going to put that hole mount on the squad in there and a hole mount <coughs> on the squad there. So we'll resolve the shooting. Uh, oh, we're in ambush. So actually, we're going to resolve that first. So he comes up here, he does his turn. You can, you can declare your ambush at any point. Uh, he gets to here, and if, if he was going to start to turn, and then you can activate your ambush. So we're going to activate that ambush. We're going to fire our, our anti-tank rifle. The anti-tank rifle has a 36 inch range, so it's 18 to short. So obviously we're clearly a short 15. So normally a three. So if we hit, if we roll, we'll go ahead and roll it. Six. So that's a hit. It'd be nice to get that six on the penetration shot. But so, so we do hit, we score, we're plus two penetration. We need a six. To be able to cause a damage chart on that and at a glancing blow. I call it glancing blow. I think it's a glance. So here we go. Woo. Nope. So one, ones always fail. Even if that was a super heavy anti-tank gun, ones always fail. So we do score a hit on that. So do we pin it? So it's a regular Panzer 38 and uh, has a pen, pen, pen value of at least plus one that can actually damage him. We could have scored a six and got the damage chart. Uh, so that's important. It's not just uh, any heavy weapon. It's that can actually damage them. Take a pin as normal. If the regular vehicle takes a hit with a pin value of at least plus one that cannot damage, then it's a one, two, three, four, five, or six scenario. One, two, three, it scores a pin. Four, five, or six, it ignores it. So we, in that situation, at short range, we could actually damage it which means get a result on the damage chart. So, we put a pin on it. <clears throat> That's not too bad. Because <clears throat> now this thing's firing us medium machine guns at minus one. So we're gonna go ahead and fire the medium machine guns. Now, at, at first glance, when that tank first came up there, I thought if I was a Gurkha player, I might go down uh, if I was facing two medium machine guns. So my anti-tank rifle, it made this tank give its front armor and get that uh, gun out of the arc of the Gurkhas. And now I also put a pin on it. So it's only five shots at minus one for pin and minus one for moving. So as a Gurkha player with the veterans, I'll take that. So five shots going against the Gurkhas. Pretty good roll. I'm using fives. And then uh, fives to wound. So it would take off one Gurkha and cause a pin. That's not horrible. <clears throat> We've kind of got their tank committed. But then we're going to have five shots on that squad over there. That's going to be uh, super sixes because of the movement pin hardcover and nothing. So not too, not too bad. So then we obviously play through some more of the scenario or more of the game. <clears throat> and it's going to come back to turn two. Uh, these Gurkhas, if they pass their check, what they're going to probably, they want to get to here. They can pretty much, with the help of that anti-tank rifle, they can kind of ignore this tank a little bit. Because this thing's not going to want to give its rear armor uh, or side armor to that anti-tank rifle. So they're going to just run up here. <coughs> Assuming they pass their order check. There's their casualty they took. <clears throat> and then uh, that would be on the and that would be in turn one, and then we'll start turn two. So starting turn two, no matter how the order dice come out, the remaining player with the help of the anti tank rifle and the squad kind of put this tank in a little bit of a uh, decision. Has to make a decision. It, <clears throat> if it passes, it, if we get the first order dice, we can shoot that, and put a second pin on it, or we can wait. Go in ambush, that'll lock it from moving. And if it does move, we can trigger our ambush. Uh, it's a, those are, these are always 50-50 calls because it's like get that second pin on or, or go for uh, freezing that tank in place or making it decide and then find the second shot. Uh, a lot of people like to take the second pin and try to get that lucky six to get a glance and crew stun it. Uh, and then you know, then you then it goes on a down order, and then you really start to get an advantage. Or you can wait and uh, 
try to get a better shot on the side. Uh, if it was a, yeah, that's a, it's an interesting. I, I, sometimes I wait too much. The only the only bad thing is, I, and I guess here's the thing. Say you pull the first order dice and you fire, and you score a hit or a miss and get another pin. Uh, let's say miss. And then you're already on your order dice. And that tank, there's nothing to keep it, nothing at all to keep it from driving to point blank, you know, or whatnot. So uh, sometimes by holding and freezing an enemy, you're, you're with 30 points, you're freezing 135 or 125 points. 135, I think. So, you know, in a trade situation, 30 points to freeze 130, you're 100 points advantage somewhere else on the battlefield. So, I would probably, uh, obviously everything's contingent on other things happening on the board, but uh, I would probably put this in ambush. Once I put it in ambush, I'm gonna put the burden on my opponent to figure out what he's gonna do, because that Romanian squad probably came up to the thing. My more, I'm more important, uh, things might be going on in, in, regarding this infantry squad uh, taking control of that centerpiece getting inside there maybe or uh, something else on the board but uh, an ambush order is very simple if, if the remaining player fails this check great he'll back up uh, six inches probably drive a little bit off the road and uh, not be able to do utilize road movement on the next turn if he passes then let's just say that uh, even if we don't have an order dice, he's still going to have to think about, say he pulls the first order dice and passes. What's he going to do? Driving this way doesn't do much good. Turning and giving up a side, we still haven't gone on order dice. He could try to hope and go this way and fire the coax this way, but then that doesn't help him. He's not putting a full burden of shots on the, on the Gurkhas. So even if he passes his order check and he and we were hoping to get the first order dice and we don't and he's gonna go ahead and fire just like he did we can go down it's not a big deal if we go down uh, I think we're right outside six uh, normally threes down fives hitting on fives winning on fives we, it, it'd be bad luck if we lose another guy uh, and then the other one here would need sevens so the, he could sit there for quite a while while we pink at him trying to get but again, you're freezing up a lot of points uh, from the enemy's tank, and we're kind of keeping it frozen there. Once we know where it's at, these guys could go this way and get out of that. Uh, or once they get into there, they're going to be a lot diff more difficult to hit. Uh, we can start working. If we had another anti-tank asset, try, trying to work towards a side shot or something on it and make him choose which facing he's going to go. So, like... Without an anti-tank rifle, there's nothing keeping that from uh, just driving to wherever it wants and close point blanking my, our infantry with the uh, two medium machine guns. So the anti-tank rifle is more of a deterrent. Uh, it's not going to knock out tanks. Aha! Boom! Knock out a tank. It's more of a deterrent. <clears throat> it's more of a freeze. Now, if this was a medium tank with a nine armor, this. Now we're looking at the 50-50 chance against a regular tank to even put a hit on it. So we're going to be a little bit more, we could still do the same thing if this was a medium tank. We'd still be able to uh, make him choose to give us a side shot or whatnot. But it's much less effective when you're not able to put that single pin on for a front shot automatically because we wouldn't be able to harm a 9 armed tank to the front. But, all right, I guess that's about it for anti-tank rifles. Other than that, uh, it's not really one that uh, I would be aggressive with as far as trying to run it. Now, you theoretically, you can. You can move, you can move and fire these, take a movement penalty. So, if this tank... If this tank ended up saying I'm not worried about the anti-tank rifle and starts risking it because maybe I left something exposed over here, and it ends up like you know like this and you're looking at you know a side shot and there's no other threats you could theoretically advance out get into the rear take a rear shot 
I mean, if you want to leave your cover and take that rear shot, you can move and fire it, movement minus one, and then go from there. I, I, I tend to play these just like I was demonstrating. I keep them in a nice concealed position, cover position, and deter enemy from freely moving around in front of you. Now, if that tank got knocked out, then, then that's the only armor that they have, then what's the point of this anti-tank rifle? It is nice if he had if that, that veteran squad ends up fighting around this structure and people say you can use it like a light or like a poor man's sniper or a heavy sniper so you're looking at an 18 inch short range which in this situation is still probably going to be long unless they're manning this building or this wall so you got a pretty decent short range because you'd be hitting if something was in this building you'd be hitting it on normally a three hardcover five hitting on a five which is obviously not a sniper but you'd be killing on plus two so you'd be killing five infantry uh, veteran infantry needing a five on threes so it's kind of a reverse sniper in that sense so a sniper hits on threes kills on five we would be in short range hitting on five killing on threes so that's kind of what they say uh, about that reverse sniper thing so it's not bad uh, obviously it's got a 36 inch range so we're firing stuff way down into the deployment zone uh, you will take a long range penalty but if they're in soft cover again you're hitting on fives and killing on threes or twos if they're regular but all right so that's about anti-tank rifle and we talk about uh, some of the other things all right so we're going to substitute that anti-tank rifle scenario for a bazooka team we're just pretending these British or Americans so, you put a bazooka team in there, plus five penetration, 24 inch range. You basically are locking down this roadway from anybody wanting to just drive down. There's no way an eight armor tank is going to be able to take that much without dying pretty quickly. Um, you know, you get you score those, you're hitting on maybe hitting on fours if they stay at long range. But you're killing on basically a two up, or at least scoring a glance on two up. Uh, if he stays farther back, uh, or if he comes and he's not going to want to come any closer than that. But he probably wouldn't want to go. He, what he'd probably do is try to drive through the brick and get into that courtyard or drive through the trees. So you're slowing down his avenue, you're denying the road movement and the quick uh, move up. And you may say, well, I could take an anti tank gun for the same. For the same thing and that's true but that's a separate slot you can have an anti-tank gun and a, and a mortar or not a mortar a uh, bazooka and have them on separate things what's nice about a bazooka team as opposed to like an anti-tank team is that we're putting it in, in rough ground in this nice piece of terrain if this was an anti-tank gun we can't move it for the rest of the game where a bazooka team's infantry based and later in the game if the threat changes or no longer worried about that we can move it out and go go seek targets or go to another spot or an anti-tank gun, you put it there, it's frozen in rough ground. Also, if they have a mortar and they're firing mortar shots, trying to dislodge an anti-tank gun, you can't move it, they're eventually going to get it. So you end up having to put an anti-tank gun, usually behind a wall or some other structure, but it's not, nor, usually it's difficult to find as good a protection as rough ground protection. So you're going to have uh, your anti-tank gun usually is a little bit more exposed because if you want to be able to move it to get it out of the way of a, of a mortar zeroing in on it, you, you've got to move it every now and then. The other nice thing is a, is a bazooka can move and fire. So if this was a, if we had an anti-tank gun, say, back here somewhere, I'm using the edge of this to cover the road, and uh, the tank can move into a position where it doesn't get the hard cover, but until that point, they start zeroing in on a, with a mortar, we have to move it, or we face getting, say, a four up on the mortar or a three up, we have to move it, we can't fire it. Bazooka can move and fire. So uh, if they start trying to zero in on our bazooka team with a mortar, we could always move and fire, taking the minus one to hit. So bazooka team against that roadway, that light tank is not going to want to come down that, even to the front armor. And even if you upgrade to like a Panzer IV, Romanian Panzer IV here, uh, that's still something that that tank is not going to want to subject itself to. You're still doing the same 
split principle. You're not allowing this thing to come around and put bold meter machine guns on that target. Uh, the anti-tank gun uh, probably doesn't want to be trying to shoot at infantry unless it's a squad and a nice shot because it's got a two-inch template. It's out of building. So you're doing the same concept, same principle, but with more firepower. Uh, the I wouldn't drive my tank up that way until I had this bazooka team nullified somehow uh, because you're just looking at uh, a four up with a uh, four two glance so 50 50 chance to hit 50 50 chance to wound or to score a hit uh, to score a armor penetration so uh, for 60 ish 50 ish six, 50 to 60 points you know you're uh, you're nullifying the full capability of a 235 point tank. It's a nice trade-off in all reality. Now, if this was your sole armor uh, deterrer, yeah, you'll deny the road, but that tank would be driving over there somewhere. And then you're looking at trying to run across the board, exposing yourself to get to a... So, they're not great to have as your sole thing, because this tank said, well, I'm not gonna come down that road, I'm gonna come driving down here threaten the infantry and assets and maybe artillery piece or something over there and then you're kind of you're not wanting to try to it's not a, it's not a tank it's a bazooka team it's great for defensive it keeps enemy tanks back in cover it makes them go a different way so uh yeah so we fire this bazooka at this tank we really need a three long range four Ooh. hits on a five we have plus five penetration we don't lose a penetration for going over long or over half range so we're plus five, nine front armor. Oh, look at that, 10. You got a full penetration shot. And then you just consult the damage chart as normal. Four, five, or six will kill it. Six killed it. Boom, look at that. Nice magic. And that's 235 point tank destroyed out of the game. So bazookas are, are very nice. It's basically a medium and a tank gun. Uh, actually, yeah, less range, but doesn't lose the penetration over long. But, um, and really Panzerfaust is going to be the same, uh, but it's plus six penetration, same exact, uh, uh, type of, uh, usage for the most part. And then, uh, the Piat team, now that's a little bit trickier because this only has a 12 inch range. So the Piat team has a 12 inch range and that's very short. So a lot of times you find yourself moving and trying to shoot it. Uh, if you're trying to use it to go hunting armor, it's not really the best. Uh, usually, since a lot of times uh, the ally don't have uh, anti-tank uh, assets inside their units, you want to use it in conjunction with a squad, and then it just kind of trails along behind and gives it a, a key. This tank, in all likelihood, would not drive down to here to get some machine gun shots on these guys if these guys still haven't activated, because this guy could just move right up here to point blank you know and then start trying to knock it out but so it just kind of keeps tanks honest is what it does for for a lower point cost now kind of talk about Panzerfaust and, and other entry in flamethrowers and Panzerfaust and stuff infantry base that's really what they're similar to the Piat team that's where you kind of transition from the Piat into these individual teams is that their infantry there's infantry squad support units. They, that were a bazooka and a Panzer Shrek are more anti-tank team. They're, these are falling to infantry support. So we'll talk about them when we talk about infantry upgrades. But obviously, if you know you have a, a, a flamethrower team, the enemy's gonna have the same principle as the Piat team, which is an anti-tank team, is that they're, they're gonna keep at bay they're not going to just drive to point blank and fire multiple machine guns uh, into your squad that they catch in because you run up there. This hasn't gone yet. With no anti-tank or heavy weapon asset anywhere, this bazooka team got knocked out or something. You know, you're really looking at a hard time. So you just come around. You're firing point blank range on those guys with 10 medium machine guns. You caught them on a run order. You're going to do a lot of damage. So. Obviously, if a Piat team was here, he's not going to want to do that. If there's a squad base 
uh, if this squad, like the Germans, have Panzerfaust in them, that ain't, that's not happening. Unless they completely forget, which I've done, that Panzerfausts are in there. Because they shoot just like a Piat. They, they have a 6 inch range. I mean, I'm sorry, they have a 12 inch range, just like a Piat. They have a, a plus 6 penetration. So 6 inches would be their long range. So, uh, and they're basically a 5 point Piat that they can put multiples in their squad. It's, it's awesome, actually. It's one of the biggest advantages that the, the German list and other lists that can take those are. It's great. Because then you don't have to worry about that squad being supported. It can defend itself to keep a tank at bay. It's not a, they're not great at hunting tanks just like the Piat. They're not going to flow up and run up and advance and cross train to try to go hunt a tank normally. It's more of a defensive measure. But you will knock a tank out a lot of times with it. So the flamethrower, it's the same thing, six inch range. Now the flamethrower against a tank is a little bit different in that uh, when, you, when you roll a hit, it's D6 hits, so just two. Two hits, it's plus three penetration. Uh, I believe the FAQ says against the top armor, so that would be a, an eight, we need five to glance. We didn't get any, so we didn't knock it out with our flamethrower shot, but it does cause D3 pins and it also, uh, it's actually D3 plus one pins and it causes a tear check. So D3 pins, uh oh, four pins, that'd be testing on a five. So even if we didn't kill it, oh, it passed. But even if we didn't kill it, we just put a crap ton of pins on it and, uh, and uh, almost made it run away. Bail, the t crew would bail out of the tank and it'd be considered destroyed from the tear check. They're very powerful, <laughs> they're very powerful against tanks because of the pinning and the tear check factor. And now we, we put multiple pins on that. Now we can take our time and try to knock it out. Well, it's either gonna to have to rally or the shooting is gonna be very ineffective if it even passes. And that we just put that tank in a big pickle. So these short range things, you're gonna see this quite a bit. Uh, boom, put them in a the truck. You're gonna see Flamethrower sometimes in a Jeep uh, of some sort. Panzerstreck team in a Jeep. Uh, Piat team in a Jeep. Like little, they're small transport Jeeps. They're very cheap. You can't put a machine gun on it and keep the transportability. But uh, if you use it as a transport, you got a 12 inch advance. You got one in one turn and the turn coming from reserve on a run or something, get up to there. Then you can jump a, a team out into some cover. Uh, you're going to see this a lot with flamethrowers, which we're not really talking about flamethrowers that much, but the ant so basically when I was talking about a bazooka hunting tanks when he was here in the house, you're not going to want to send them out trying to respond. An anti-tank weapon, say this road wasn't here and it's not something we really wanted to lock down right away, we didn't know where his tank was going to be, a, a bazooka team in a jeep is a nice response vehicle. Let's, or let's just go German since we've got the Kubel wagon here. Uh, so we've got the enemy deployed. They've done their deployment. We've left this Jeep in reserve with a uh, Panzerschreck team in it. Wherever that enemy deploys his tank, we're going to be able to have a very rapid response and contain it. Uh, I, sometimes I see people too aggressive. They try to go hunting the tank. I would say they deploy their tank over there. All right, we're bringing our Panzerstreck team in on a run order this turn. Boom, run to there. Now it's sitting there. That they, We've just frozen that tank from trying to come up because we can hop out and fire that turn. Uh, and now we just did what we did here. We're locking down, hopefully locking that tank behind in a bad situation where we may not be threatening to kill it every turn, but we now have eliminated a 200 some point tank from, from affecting the game by freezing it in place until they can send other assets to try to dislodge our uh, Panzer Shrek team. Or Panzer, yeah, Panzer Shrek. Um, yeah, I do, I do like that idea a lot. When I took my uh, Airborne, uh, I should have probably took a couple, like a transport Jeep from my bazooka to give it that mobility factor because uh, once you deploy them on the board if they haven't if they've got that tank in reserve unless, unless there's something you want to lock down for sure like say you've got an anti-tank gun over there 
and you want to lock down this side of the board with something, you can place it. But if you don't know where you want it, and sometimes you don't, maybe you're facing a, a, a platoon with multiple vehicles, uh, multiple uh, an armored car and a tank, you don't know where you're going to need your assets. You know, it's nice to have that mobility, get them up in, and, and I don't recommend trying to drive up with a bazooka team. Oh, let me see that. Drive up with a bazooka team or panda strip team and hop out and fire. I don't recommend that. Uh, you could be successful with it, uh, it, but you're putting your points at risk. I mean, obviously, obviously if this was the situation, there's nothing else on the board. It's not really that big of a deal. It might be worth it. You're looking at a, normally a three, move four, point blank three, hit, uh, double penetration, two crew stuns. Whoops, didn't kill it. But, uh, <laughs> double ones, that's funny. Uh, but you do kind of, when you do, when you do these kind of rush type tactics, uh, you've got to understand that you're likely going to trade one order dice. And if it's a powerful thing that you're very afraid of, it may be worth it. But you're going to probably be trading one order dice for two of your order dice. Because if they have an infantry squad or anything over there and they kill this squad, even if they sniper it and they kill it, at the end of a turn, unloaded transports will die and they will run away. So if they're closer to the enemy than your own stuff. So you gotta be careful. You don't wanna trade two order dice for one of theirs, even though it might feel good to get the kill, if it's not really tactically advantageous. If the scenario is counting kill points, you just did him a favor by offering up two of your order dice. Uh, so it's a gamble to do those rush type of things. And it, that, that goes for flamethrowers as well. If you're going to do it that with a flamethrower, make sure you're not just doing it because you can. Uh, you want to knock out something that is threatening, the, something that is threatening to pick up multiples of your order dice and then respond to it and try to stop it. But uh, all right, guys, uh, I'm probably sure there's more things that I uh, was going to talk about. And now that I... Uh, forget <laughs> it's been kind of a hectic couple days but uh we'll go ahead and get this video up uh, as always uh, your comments and thought process and your uh, interaction is uh, appreciated and helpful and uh, I really like to discuss this stuff and I like to uh, think about it. I think it helps me as a player to kind of go over situations and scenarios and we'll try to get a uh, We'll we still got to cover any tank guns and mortars and squad based stuff and we'll work our way up and then we'll end up we'll all be on the same speed as far as combined arms and uh, then we'll set up some uh, more intricate uh, we'll try to set up some more intricate tactics uh, regarding multiple squads and stuff we'll go from deployment all the way to uh, mid game and then uh, some very important end game uh, strategies depending on the scenario uh, that many of the newer and uh, and even uh, more uh, experienced players sometimes forget in the heat of the battle that uh, it's all about the scenario when you can pick up uh, uh, quick order dice on transports and things like that. Just little tips like that, things I've encountered in the tournament circuit that uh, are important to think about. So, all right, guys, see you soon.